As we continue our journey in the chronological Bible called The Story, we turn the page and find ourselves in what must be the most exciting book in the Bible, the book of Joshua. This Old Testament story is in the Bible to teach us that our best days are ahead of us. Maybe you find yourself in the wilderness like the children of Israel did. And maybe you feel like you're walking in circles. Well, the book of Joshua introduces to all readers a seven-year period of history in which the children of Israel were brought out of the wilderness and they occupied the promised land. And for these seven years, the Hebrew people were untouchable. They defeated well over 30 kings. They engaged and were victorious in over 20 battles. And they reclaimed an inheritance of over 10,000 square miles. Seven years of unbridled success. They were outnumbered, but they were never outpowered. They were under-equipped but they were never overwhelmed. They were the unlikely but unquestioned conquerors of the most barbaric armies in history. Had this been a prize fight, the referee would have called it in the first round. There was scarcely a contest. And for these seven years, the Hebrew people were unstoppable. Now, they hadn't always been. The Bible never glosses over the checkered checkered history of, of God's chosen people. Abraham had too many wives. Jacob told too many lies. Esau sold his birthright. The brothers of Joseph sold Joseph. Then came the 400 years of slavery, 40 years in the wilderness, then later 70 years of Babylonian detention. The Hebrews built two temples only to lose them. They were given the Ark of the Covenant, and nobody knows where it is to this day. Babylonia was strong. Babylonia built her cities. Greece was strong, flexed her muscles. Rome was strong. Rome stretched the Roman Empire. But in the ancient days, Israel always seemed to be the kid in the corner with a black eye, except for these seven years. I like to call them the glory days of Israel. In this era, brief as it is, glistens on the timeline of your Bible somewhere between Moses and the days of Judges which lead into Saul, David, Solomon, and the establishment of the kingdoms. We're right about 1400 B.C. And somewhere around 1400 B.C., after the children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, God spoke to Moses' protege, Joshua. And Joshua listened. And because Joshua and the children of Israel listened and obeyed, the Jordan River opened up. The Jericho walls came down. The sun stood still. And those 31 kings were forced into early retirement. Evil was booted and hope was rebooted. It was an extraordinary season in the history of ancient Israel. The children of Israel, Bedouin shepherds they were, yet they began to inherit their land. They began to inhabit farms that they didn't build and and reap from, from land that they had not tilled. And they received the benefit of vineyards they had not created. Their accomplishments were so total that the summary statement of the book of Joshua found in Joshua 21, 43 through 45 reads, So the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. And the Lord gave them rest all around according to all he had sworn to their fathers, 
and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand, and not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. What sweeping statements. The Lord gave all the land. The Lord gave them rest. Not a man of all their enemies stood against them. It all came to pass. The wilderness gave way to the promised land, and the winter chill gave way to the springtime thaw, and a new season began. Could you use a new season in your life? The book of Joshua is a book of history, but it's even more. It's also a book of theology because it reveals to us the mind and ways of God. The promise we draw from the book of Joshua is God will give you a new season. He'll take you out of the wilderness and he'll walk you into your promised land. And the lesson in the book of Joshua is this is done not as we conquer the land, but as we receive the land. In fact, here's the key word if you like to fill in blanks. The key word in the book of Joshua is inheritance, inheritance. It might surprise you to know that in a book that is considered a book of military conquest, at no point is Joshua told to take the land. He's simply told to receive the land. The word inheritance appears in the book of Joshua. Does anybody want to take a guess how many times? 51 times. You were at the early service, weren't you, Jay? 51 times. The word inheritance is to the book of Joshua what taco stands are to San Antonio. Abundant and on every corner. The resounding theme in the book of Joshua is receive your inheritance. Live out of your inheritance. Receive what God has given to you. In fact, Joshua 24, 28 sounds like the most important sentence in the book when the writer says, so Joshua let the people depart each to his own, you want to say it? Inheritance. Inheritance. No one, no one went home that day saying, look, we took the land. But everyone went home that day saying, Oh, finally, we received the land. The theme, inheritance, appears as early as the second verse of the first chapter where God said to Joshua, Arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. (laughs) Not the land which they must conquer, and not the land that they must prove worthy, not the land that they must earn or confiscate or purchase. Go to the land I am giving to them. The transaction had already happened. Joshua wasn't sent to take the land but to receive the land. Victory was certain because victory was God's. And the Hebrews had a new land simply because God had promised it to them centuries before. About the time Joshua lifted his jaw off the ground, God explained the dimensions of the gift. He said, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness in this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, to the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. Now remember, it's just a, a generation ago that these Two or three million people were slaves. And then they spent 40 years as gypsies, Bedouin shepherds. This is no military force we're talking about here. And yet God dangled the keys to the promised land in front of Joseph, and he took them. He began to live out of his inheritance. Are you living out of yours? We've looked at the key word. Now can I offer a key question? Are you living out of your inheritance? 
or are you living out of your circumstance? Did you know you are an heir to God's fortune? You are an heir to God's fortune. The reason we say that Joshua is more than a book of history, but it's a book of theology, is because the Apostle Paul, the great theologian, loved this theme of being heirs of God. And what God said to the children of Israel, God says to us, you have an inheritance. For example, from Ephesians chapter 1. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our, what's the word, church? Inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Do you know what happened to you when you believed? An invisible yet unmistakable transaction occurred. You were sealed. You were sealed like a saran wrap was wrapped around you. You were sealed. This is the same image that's used to describe the protection of graves in the Old Testament. So people would know that the grave was occupied and that if that seal was ever broken, then people would know that grave robbers had appeared. It's that same word, that same description. So when you believed, you were sealed with and indwelt by the Holy Spirit so that when Satan and his interlopers appear, they come and they see the name of Christ on your heart. You've been sealed by him. You've been indwelt by him. This is your inheritance. You are not just a slave of God, though that position would have marvelous benefits. You're not just a servant of God, but that in and of itself would be a privilege. You're not just a saint of God, though indeed you are. Yes, you are more. You are sons. You are daughters of God. You have an inheritance. You sit at his table. You have your name in his book. You have your, his spirit in your heart. And he has set about the task of reshaping you along the lines of his son. Oh, the Apostle Paul loved this theme. He picked it up again in the book of Galatians. He said, if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And heirs, there it is again according to the promise. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has made you also an heir. The will has been executed. The courts have been satisfied. Your spiritual account has been funded. In another passage, this time in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us the extent to which your spiritual account has been funded. He says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are, what's the word, church? Heirs. Heirs of God. And here you go, co-heirs with Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. We would be content to be distant heirs. Let everything else be distributed. We'll take the penance. Whatever's left over, a few crumbs from the table of heaven will do us, but it will not satisfy God. He declares that you are a co-heir with Christ. In other words, whatever Christ receives, you can receive. Don't you look at me like that. Whatever Christ receives, you can receive. Do you think Christ has received abundant joy? That same joy level is yours. Do you think Christ has access to love for all people? That love is available to you. Do you think Christ drinks from a reservoir of peace? You and Jesus Christ share the same reservoir. You are a co-heir with Christ. What Christ receives, you receive. You are, hear me now, you and Christ have equal standing in heaven. Equal standing. 
since you are wrapped in Christ by the gift of grace, since you have believed in him, the Apostle Paul said, when you believed, you were sealed, stamped, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You have been wrapped in Christ, so you are now a co-heir with Christ. Do you know what happened to you when you believed? Now, many of you are thinking, all right, <laughs> oh, then you say, I have the peace of Christ, then why do I feel like a perfect mess? You say, I have the joy level of Christ, then why am I as grumpy as a donkey? You say, I can forgive like Christ can forgive, then why do I have so many grudges? Hmm. How do I explain the disconnect between what the Bible says I am in the way I feel. A couple of possible answers. For some people, they didn't know about their inheritance. That might be one answer. We just don't know about our inheritance. Nobody ever told you that you are heir to the peace of God. Nobody ever told you that greater is he who lives in you than he who lives in the world. Nobody ever told you that you're a son and a daughter of God. Many people live with the assumption that the purpose of being a Christian is to keep you guy or gal out of hell. And that when you believe, it, it's kind of like going through a car wash. Just get all the dirt washed off but nothing changes on the inside. You drive in an old clunker, you come out a clean clunker. <laughs> and nobody ever told you that when you're in the car wash, God reaches in and he dismounts that old V6 engine with cracked cylinders, and he replaces it with the Ferrari of his Holy Spirit in the presence of God. Maybe nobody told you. Maybe all you thought the purpose of being a Christian was to stay out of hell, while really the purpose of being a Christian is to be indwelt by heaven, to be equipped, to be grown, to be developed, where God moves in and he reclaims every bit of you from top to bottom, mouth, hands, feet, brain, every part of you he begins to indwell, where you become the very presence of Christ. Maybe nobody told you that. But now someone has. Now you know. For many people, though, th there's a disconnect between what the Bible says they are and what they are because nobody told them. But for others, there's a disconnect because they simply don't believe it. We just don't believe in our inheritance. This was the case with Moses and his followers. Remember, the children of Israel could have entered the promised land 40 decades, 40 years, four decades earlier, right? Why didn't they? Well, did you notice what God said to Joshua? God said, God brought us, I, I, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. There it is, Joshua 1 and verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, just a little bit of a dig there. I told Moses and his people this. I said this to them, and the implication is they didn't believe me. Joshua believed. Now, so Joshua moved into the promised land because he believed his inheritance. Were there still problems in taking the promised land? Yes. For one thing, there was the raging Jordan River at high tide, and he had to get several million people through that river. And so when he stepped forward, he said, well, the circumstance says I can't cross that river, but my inheritance says that land is ours. So they went into the river, the water opened, and across they went. First thing they saw was the city of Jericho, inhabited by evil, barbaric, child, uh, people who offered children for child sacrifices, bloodthirsty, barbaric people who were safely encased in this large, walled city. 
And so Joshua thought, well, the circumstance says we could never take that city. But the inheritance says, I'm a child of God, and, and he has given us this land. And so he took God at his word, and they began to walk around the city, and you know what happened. The walls came down. And that continued one miracle after another, after another, after another. They still had struggles, mind you, but they believed. They lived out of their inheritance, not out of their circumstance. Would you like to do the same? There was a time in which Moses said this to the children of Israel. He said, God brought us out from there in order to bring us in. God brought us out in order to bring us in. Did you know God says the same to you? He brought you out of a life of sin in order to bring you into a life of redemption. He didn't intend for you to get stuck in the wilderness. He brings you out so that he can lead you in. All you have to do is step forward in faith. Can I encourage you to receive your inheritance? Just receive it. Let your mindset shift. you got some problems next week, and you can either look at those problems for what they are, or you can look at your heavenly Father for what he gave. And you can begin to live out of your inheritance. To live out of your inheritance does not mean you pretend that life is easy. Just the opposite. It's a recognition that life is tough. And you need all the help you can get. But by faith you believe that God has taken up residence within you. And he's not going to give you anything that you can't face. Imagine the difference this makes. Suppose you get a knock at the door this evening when you get home. You're not used to letting people into your house, especially strangers. But this person introduces himself as a, as a lawyer who deals in large estates. And he says, I'm here to talk to you about your inheritance. And you say, whoa, okay. Well, come on in. And he asks you, um, did your mother grow up in England? Well, yes, she did. Oh, was she a school teacher in Chicago? Well, yes, she was. And did she and your father retire to Florida? Well, yes, they did. And did she pass away some five years ago? Oh, that's my mom. And is your name John Smith, Jr.? That's me. Well, by now, you're very curious. And the lawyer closes up his portfolio, and he says, we've been looking for you. Your mother had an uncle who passed away and left her an inheritance. And now, as the surviving heir, that inheritance comes your way. Oh, you smile and think, oh, cool, that's great. I can, I can buy those new shoes at Macy's. He says, it's, it's quite large. You think, I guess I'll go to Nordstrom's. He says, it's more than you can imagine. You think, I'm going to go to Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> and then he says, your mother's uncle had a gold mine in South Africa. And it's going to take many years for that gold mine to play out. But we want to go ahead and give you a deposit on your inheritance. And you look down and there's a check for $20 million. And you think, I'm going to buy Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> that same little leap in the heart you felt as I was telling you that story, that's tiny compared to the inheritance that awaits a child of the Almighty God. Your inheritance is so great, so splendid, so beyond any word that you could ever put around it that it's going to take all of eternity for you to enjoy the glory that awaits you as God restores his planet to its Garden of Eden splendor. And we live in day-by-day -day communion with him in a world there are, where there are no graves and no tears and no disease. But you don't have to wait until you get to heaven to begin enjoying your inheritance. 
because the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that has taken up residence within you. And the same power that has created the heavens and the earth is the same power that's going to help you face your Monday. The same power that decided you were worth redeeming is the same power who's going to lead you into your tomorrow. All that falls to you and me to do is make a Joshua decision. Oh, there's a Jordan River, but God said. Oh, there's a Jericho, but God said. Oh, there's those evil kings, but God said. And you counter every problem with a God said. That's called living out of your inheritance. Well, I've got that $20 million check. I've got the deposit of the Holy Spirit in my heart, sealing as a guarantee. But God said, roaring before many of you right now, is the Jordan River of guilt. You bear such shame over decisions you've made, acts you'd love to erase from your past. And that shame, that guilt is keeping you from moving in to your promised land. Listen, as you live out of your inheritance, you stand on promises like Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 that says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You receive the promise of Ephesians 2.8. That says we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that nobody can boast. And you receive the Old Testament promise that God's mercies are new every morning. What you did may not have been right, but who God is is good. And you begin to receive that inheritance, and you begin to allow those mistakes to be in the past, and you press into the future. That's what it means to live out of your inheritance. Some of you are looking at Jericho walls full of fear. You have so many things you're worried about, you can't keep up with them. They're keeping you out of, the, out of the promised land. In fact, they're keeping you up at night. You've got so many things you're anxious about, everything from the presidential election to the pimple on your toe, all kinds of things that just worry you. You worry, you worry, you worry. But then you start living out of your inheritance. You begin remembering what the Apostle Paul said, that you can be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, you can make requests be made known to God with thanksgiving in your heart. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You begin to live out of, out of your inheritance. I'm a child of God. I'm known by God. He's going to protect, for, protect me, and he's going to provide for me. As some of you are, are surrounded by the kings of confusion, just like, just like Joshua was surrounded by the kings of evil. You have kings of confusion. You don't know what your identity is. You don't know why you wake up every day. The goal of existence, you assume, is to make it to the next paycheck and then sober up and make it to the next one again. And then you begin to live out of your inheritance and you read in the Bible that you were made in the image of God. Uh, you're an emblem bearer, image bearer of God's image. Uh, and then you read that when you say yes to him, he says yes to you and he moves in. And he begins to change you day by day from one degree of glory to the next. And then you believe your inheritance that you're going to receive the new kingdom and the new earth a saint, and you're going to reign with God forever and ever and ever. doesn't mean you won't have any trouble. It does mean, though, you have a guarantee that you will have more victory than you do defeat. You'll come to have more courage than you have fear. And you'll come to be known as a person of hope and not a person of despair. Does that appeal to you? I close with this remarkable, brief passage that is tucked away in the first epistle of John. John, the beloved apostle, made this statement. He said, in this world, we are like Jesus. That's what a co-heir is. In this world, we are like Jesus. And when we pray, God listens to us like he would listen to Jesus. And when we speak out against the devil, the devil has to leave, just as he did when Jesus spoke. And when we step into storms, God comes to help us, just as God came to help Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. You are not a normal person. 
And there's something different about you. And when you walk into a room, yes, Jesus himself walks into that room. That's your inheritance. You've got to say no to all those voices. Perhaps they were voices from your parents or your coaches or your, I don't know, your pastors through the years who told you lie after lie after lie, who held you back, who told you to sit down, who told you you weren't worth much, you couldn't be forgiven. Those are lies. They come straight from the devil. Don't they smell like his bad breath? But the message of God is the message of hope. He believes in you, and he has given you an inheritance. May you live out of your inheritance. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of inheritance. Help us to become who we are, children of God, heirs of the promise. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said...